14-year-old Nicole Smith lived in Atlanta, Georgia in 1995. On June 7th, she and her sister were walking to Ralph Bunch Middle School. On the way, Nicole realized she forgot something at home. She then headed back alone and cut through the woods. Sadly, Nicole would never make it home. In the woods, she came across a man who indecently assaulted her and then attacked her twice in the face. Investigators collected male DNA from her body and stored it for later use. Despite investigators' efforts, they didn't find any useful leads and the case went cold. In 2002, Detective Vincent Vellis reopened the case. For two years, he was unsuccessful in his quest, but then a small breakthrough was made. In 2004, 13-year-old Betty Brown of East Point, Georgia, was indecently assaulted by a man. Fortunately, she survived the attack. It happened just miles away from where Nicole's life was taken. Investigators found DNA from both attacks is the same. The Smith's attacker most likely lived in the area. Betty was able to describe the suspect as an African-American man, possibly in his 30s. A sketch was made and shared around but didn't lead to anything. Detective Velasco worked the case tirelessly, being in constant contact with Smith's family, conducting hundreds of interviews and over 50 blood samples before retiring in 2017. Detective Scott Demiser then took over the case, using genealogy and ancestry databases. It took investigators three years to find the person of interest. Demister got word that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Lab was able to match the DNA profile and the assault of Betty Brown. A few days later in 2022, Nicole's case could also be closed as it was confirmed that it was the same man responsible. The Atlanta Police Department then held a press conference to announce it to the public. Police did not state the suspect's name during the press conference. They said investigators wanted the moment to be about the victims, their families, and detectives who dedicated their hard work and time to solve the case. They only said the attacker passed away on August 29, 2021, while in hospice care for liver and kidney failure. Nicole's mother said she had been living without closure in the horrific incident for nearly three decades. She called the moment bittersweet and said she's fighting to take one day at a time. Today for me is a bittersweet moment. I never imagined this person to be deceased. So many unanswered questions that I had for him that I can never ask or get answers. I would never say it was closure for me because I'll live with this pain for the rest of my life, her mother said, tears running down her cheeks. Betty Brown, now all grown up with children of her own, said that she has hidden that part of her life for years. Betty also said she never thought she would see the day when she would be talking about what happened to her. I'm so afflicted because on one hand, I want to rise above and not let this control me. But on the other hand, I want his family to suffer because he's not here to suffer. I wanted to feel the pain that my family has felt for years. Furthermore, Betty stated that Nicole's mother and Detective Velasquez have both been in contact with her over the decades and that their care had been invaluable. All of these years and checking on me to make sure that I'm okay. I appreciate you because I needed that. After the press conference was done, it was revealed that the attacker was a 49-year-old Kelvin Arnold. We don't know much about this worthless individual other than the fact that he's not alive anymore and that he lived close to both of the victims. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts and comments below. For year old Jessica Gutierrez, or Jessie as she was known, lived in Red Bank, South Carolina in 1986. On Jason 6th, Jessica's mother Deborah woke up and went to Jessica's room. Deborah found a window open and no sign of Jessica. Jessica's six-year-old sister, who was in the room, said that a man with a magic hat and a beard took Jessica. Deborah called the police to report what had happened and the search started. Investigators were not able to find Jessica, but they interviewed more than 125 people and reviewed more than 3,500 documents with the help of FBI personnel from 10 field offices. The search for Jessica and the person who took her went on for years. That was until 2022. On January 6, 2022, investigators from the Lexington County Sheriff's Department announced that a 61-year-old man from Carolina had been arrested in connection to the case. The man is Thomas Eric McDowell. He was arrested by the Wake Forest Police Department in Raleigh, North Carolina. According to investigators, Thomas's fingerprints matched the fingerprint found in Jessica's room. He had apparently also confessed to people that he took Jessica and ended her life. At the time of the crime, Thomas Sosa lived in the area. He wore large cowboy hats, which might have been the magic hat that Jessica's sister was referring to. With the arrest now made, it is hoped that Thomas will reveal where Jessica's body is, assuming she's not alive anymore. In case she is alive, here's an image of what she might look like today. 
Thomas will now be prosecuted by the South Carolina Attorney General's office. He is currently being held at the Wake County Detention Center. If you like this content, subscribe my channel. We are very close to 1,000 subscribers. Let's continue the video. 48-year-old Susan Winters lived in Henderson, Nevada in 2015 with her husband Gregory Brett Dennis and two teenage daughters. Susan was a judge and Gregory was a doctor. On January 3, 2015, Gregory called 911 to report Susan was unresponsive and needed an ambulance. She was taken to the hospital but did not make it. A mixture of antifreeze was found in her system. At first, it was believed that she might have taken her own life by ingesting the antifreeze. Investigators then found Gregory had an expensive drug habit. He also stood to inherit $2 million in the event of his wife's demise. According to friends, Gregory and Susan were on the verge of separation when her life ended. Investigators also found that Greg only called emergency responders after she stopped breathing. Inexplicably, Gregory also signed a do not resuscitate order when she arrived at the hospital. Days after Susan's passing, Gregory deposited a $180,000 check from her bank account into his own bank account. The check had been issued the night before Susan lost her life. According to a friend of Gregory, he wanted the money because he knew Susan's parents would freeze the account. This meant that Gregory knew Susan would not be alive anymore before it happened. The final piece of evidence came when investigators took a look at Gregory's computer. He searched for information on the internet on how long after poisoning someone using antifreeze it would take the victim to pass away. In 2017, he was finally arrested in connection to the case. Shortly after being arrested, he posted a $250,000 bail and was released. In 2022, Gregory and his legal team pleaded guilty and agreed to a sentence of 3 to 10 years behind bars. He is scheduled to be sentenced on May 10th in the Clark County District Court. On November 17, 1978, a person cutting firewood in Climate County again came across two bodies, a young man and woman, both of them had been fatally shot. Carl Burkhart, who was then a detective for the Climate County Sheriff's Office, arrived at the scene soon after. Investigators quickly identified the first body as 19-year-old Kirk Leonard Weissman. The second was identified as 17-year-old Cynthia Lynn Freyer. In the autopsy, it was discovered that Cynthia had been indecently assaulted. Neither of the two victims had a connection to the Climate County area. Then, Chief Police Dan Toma was quoted as saying that day, you could tell whoever did it didn't have much respect for human life, the way the bodies were exposed. Deputies determined that Kirk and Cynthia had been hitchhiking through the area. One of the few items recovered from the scene was assigned the Red K-Falls. Police also determined that the two had stayed a night at the motel in Rosenberg, Oregon, and were then picked up by a person who claimed to have dropped them off at the Grand Pass restaurant. They also found a letter written by Cynthia addressed to her mother, which mentioned that she and Kirk had lots of fun in Washington State. That was all the investigators had. They knew who the victims were but not who had taken their lives. The original evidence bags from 1978 remained locked away in storage throughout the years. By 2011, Detective Nick Kennedy took over the case. He looked through the pieces of evidence for anything that could potentially be analyzed for DNA. DNA was a tool that didn't exist for law enforcement back in 1978, but the technology was becoming better every decade. Later, Detective Geneva Lewis took over from Nick Kennedy. She sent a few items of Cynthia's clothing to the Oregon State Police Prime Lab. From 2011 to 2018, little DNA was found on the items because by then they were already more than 30 years old. It was only in 2018 when Detective Dan Tower took over the case that a breakthrough would come. He received a call from Devin Moss, who worked for the crime lab. Devin Mass told him that they finally found DNA belonging to an unknown man that they could use. Devin sent the samples to another lab in Portland, Oregon. They can affirm the presence of DNA from an unknown male. It wasn't much of a breakthrough, but it was the first one police had in decades. The DNA sample was then entered into the Combined DNA Index System, a nationwide database of DNA samples. Unfortunately, there were no hits. Detective Dan Towery then decided to contact Paraban Nano Labs. Parabon had been vital in solving many cold cases over the last few years. For Parabon to test the DNA sample and help identify the person that took Kirk and Cynthia's life would cost $8,000. Investigators decided it was well worth it, it could bring peace to the families of the victims. 
Parabon then used genetic genealogy to predict the suspect's ancestry. They used that to produce what they call an app-shot image to show what the man looked like. Parabon also used the DNA to find relatives of the suspect. In 2021, they told investigators that they had a viable suspect. Ray Witzen Jr. Parabond also said that his DNA was found on Cynthia's club thing, indicating that he was definitely involved. Investigators then tried to locate Witzen. They soon learned that he passed away in Texas in 1996. He had no criminal history. At the time of the crime, he lived in the Climate County area where he worked at a lumber mill. Investigators collected a DNA sample from two of Witzen's living children. This confirmed that it was his DNA found on Cynthia's body and other pieces of evidence. Whitson's children also confirmed that he owned the same type of weapon that was used at the crime. The area where Cynthia and Kirk were found was also known to be frequented by Whitson. When investigators were confident with their findings, a report was submitted to the Climate County District Attorney Eve Costello for review. Costello said she determined that the evidence would be strong enough to prosecute Whitson if he were alive today. If we had just been 10 or 15 years earlier, we would have been able to hold the individual accountable in a way that we now cannot do, said Castillo, tears welling in her eyes. What we have been able to do is bring closure for a family because when somebody's life is taken and you don't know really what happened, you just know they left the universe in a really awful way. It leaves you with a really huge hollow feeling. This work has allowed the family to have some degree of peace. The letter that Cynthia wrote to her mother could now finally be given to her as it was a piece of evidence for all these years. What do you think about it? Scott Johnson was born in 1961 in the United States. In 1983, Scott moved to England so that he could study mathematics at the University of Cambridge. There, he met Michael Noon. Michael was a musicologist from Australia. The pair fell in love. Then in 1986, Scott moved to Canberra, Australia on a student visa to complete his PhD at the Australian National University. That way, he could be with Michael. On December 10, 1988, a man's body was found on rocks at the foot of cliffs at Bluefish Point in North Head near Manly, Sydney. The man was quickly identified as 27-year-old Scott Johnson. The police initially believed that he took his own life and jumped down the cliff. His family disputed this. They brought up the fact that his clothes were neatly folded on top of the cliff and that his wallet was stolen. One of Scott's professors also said that he had just put the final touches on his PhD. He was hopeful for the future and could have a job at any of the Greek universities around the world. Something else that pointed to the possibility that Scott was pushed and did not jump was that there were gangs of men who roamed various Sydney locations in search of gay men to hurt. It was only in 2017 that investigators believed that Scott did not take his own life. A renewed police investigation was then launched. In 2018, a $1 million reward for information that could help solve the crime was announced. Scott's brother Steve Johnson, who is a tech entrepreneur, then gave a $1 million of his own money to make the reward $2 million. The reward proved to be key to finally solving this cold case. In May of 2020, investigators arrested Scott White in connection to the case. It was announced that someone came forward and told investigators that White was the one that pushed Scott off the cliff. Then on January 10th, 2022, White confessed in court. He took responsibility for taking Scott's life. White is now convicted of the crime and will soon be sentenced. Steve had this to say following the arrest. Suddenly, it was over. This man finally found the soul to confess and put an end to this. My family are all in tears. Investigators are now looking into similar crimes that took place in the 70s and 80s. On October 29, 2007, a man's body was found in a desert area of Stanfield, Arizona, by hunters. He was identified as 37-year-old Arturo Martinez Alto Moreno. Thanks to witnesses, investigators quickly identified Oscar Tejita Mahaya as the man responsible for taking the life of Arturo. The only problem was that he was nowhere to be found. For years, the case went cold as they couldn't locate him. Then, in 2017, investigators learned that Oscar was living in Mexico. In 2018, a DNA sample was acquired with the help of a person close to Oscar, confirming his responsibility for what happened to Arturo. It took a few more years for investigators to bring Oscar back to the United States. Finally, on January 12, 2022, 59-year-old Oscar was extradited to Arizona and booked in jail. Sheriff Mark Lamb said, I am impressed by my detectives and their commitment to bringing this suspect to justice. 
When political boundaries threatened to derail their efforts, our team got creative. It is not yet known why Oscar took the life of Arturo. 51-year-old Janet Yuri lived in Kokomo, Indiana. On Thanksgiving Day in 2004, she was preparing food for her family. Later in the day, her family called her many times, but she did not answer. The next morning, on November 26th, Janet's daughter, Carly Martin, went to her house to see why Janet was not responding. She saw that the garage door was open, then she went inside and found Janet's body. Janet had been beaten. Investigators arrived at the scene and were able to find blood belonging to the suspect, which was collected for later use. Detectives from the Kokomo Police Department walked door to door in the neighborhood asking if anyone saw anything suspicious. This led them to a man from Peru named Danny Case. Case had reportedly been dropped off in Janet's neighborhood the night before Thanksgiving. With no way to get home, he started knocking on doors in an attempt to get a ride from someone. Investigators discovered that Case had been wanted in Miami County on a charge of attempting to take someone's life. On January 25, 2005, Case was arrested at Indianapolis International Airport. Frustratingly, before Kokomo detectives had a chance to speak to him, he hanged himself in his holding cell at the airport. Despite Kokomo police believing all signs pointed to Case, detectives were never able to gather enough evidence against him. The blood found at the crime scene was not sufficient for DNA testing. For 17 years, the case went cold and some speculated that there would never be closure for the family. Then, recently in 2021, an acquaintance of Case came forward and told investigators that Case once confessed to him that he took Janet's life. Case said that he knocked on the woman's door and asked about using her phone to call for a ride. It's not known why he then decided that it was necessary to end her life. In 2022, investigators met with Janet's relatives. After a lengthy discussion, the family agreed that the case should be closed due to the fact that Case is no longer alive. On January 14, 2022, it was announced to the public. Kokomo police had this to say in a statement, We understand this is a difficult time for the family as these conversations opened the wounds that the senseless tragedy left with her family. Our condolences remain with Janet Yuri and her amazing family. We pray for peace for all of you. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's see your open eyes. 63-year-old Helen Margaret Brooks lived in Apple Valley, California, in 1985. She was a well-liked woman who modeled for Lola's Fashion Boutique at the Apple Valley Inn. On July 5, 1985, Helen's friends and co-workers became alarmed after not hearing from her for a few days. They went to her home in Apple Valley Gardens Apartments, where they found Helen's body. She had been strangled. Investigators collected DNA evidence from the scene, but were limited by the DNA technology available at the time. They learned that 37-year-old Robert Eugene Wortman had met Helen in the days prior to her life being taken and was in her apartment between July 3rd and July 5th. Wortman was interviewed by investigators, and he claimed to have no knowledge of what happened to Helen, denying he went into her apartment. Investigators could not prove his responsibility, and the case went cold for many years. Over the years, several interviews and polygraph tests were conducted, but they did not bring investigators any closer to solving the case. In 2009, cold case detectives re-examined the case and submitted items for DNA testing. A DNA profile for the suspect was developed, but it did not match anyone in the DNA database. In 2021, investigators partnered with the FBI and made use of more advanced DNA technology. Finally, in 2022, they were able to confirm that Robert Eugene Wortman was indeed responsible for what happened to Helen. They found that he had an extensive violent criminal history in the years since he ended Helen's life. In August 1985, Wortman was arrested on suspicion of attempting to assault a woman at the Cockabool restaurant and bar on Highway 395 in Victorville. In 1991, a jury convicted him of assaulting a different woman at a bar in Apple Valley. In 1995, Wortman passed away while in prison, serving his 22-year sentence. Investigators are sure that he was involved in many other crimes and those cases are now under investigation. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. 41-year-old Rose Marie Moniz lived in Bristol County, Massachusetts. On March 23, 2001, Rose's father entered her home to pick her up for a doctor's appointment and tragically discovered her lifeless body on the bathroom floor. He promptly called the police. Investigators found that her purse had been emptied on the floor and an undetermined amount of cash was stolen. 
The autopsy report revealed significant trauma to her head, including skull fractures. The weapons used to inflict these injuries were identified as a seashell, a fireplace poker, and a cast iron kettle. The motive was suspected to be burglary due to the stolen money, although there was no sign of forced entry leading investigators to theorize that Rose may have known her attacker. Although DNA was found on the seashell, the technology at the time was not advanced enough for testing. In 2019, investigators with the DA's office and state police revisited Rose's case. They focused on the seashell, reasoning that the perpetrator likely put his fingers inside it to hold it during the assault. This led to the discovery of sufficient DNA for a profile, which was then confirmed to belong to David Reed, Rose's half-brother and a pallbearer at her funeral. David Reed had a history of violence. In 2003, he assaulted a woman in his truck, shoved her out, stole her purse, and left her on a road in Massachusetts. He evaded authorities during a police chase, ramming his truck into a law enforcement car and injuring an officer. Reed lived on the run for a decade in Florida, Hawaii, and Alabama. In 2015, he was captured, but charges against him were dropped when the assaulted woman passed away and there wasn't enough evidence. Reed was sentenced to three and a half to four years in prison for other charges, and during this time, his DNA was collected. In January 2022, officers arrested Reed for his half-sister's murder, and the case regarding the woman he assaulted was reopened. 23-year-old Jonathan David Rogers lived in Austin, Texas. On August 24, 2008, Jonathan was fatally shot in the chest by an unknown man near Cook Elementary School in North Austin. He was taken to a nearby hospital, but unfortunately, there was nothing they could do for him. He was gone. Over the next few years, witnesses came forward and investigators conducted numerous interviews. They finally concluded that 25-year-old DeAndre Eric Connor was responsible for what happened to Jonathan. A U.S. Marshal's lead task force then arrested Connor on January 6, 2022. He was found less than a mile away from the crime scene. Connor was taken to the Travis County Jail, where he is awaiting judicial proceedings held on a $500,000 bond. Chemical Kit He enjoyed fishing. He enjoyed hanging with his friends. He was all about family. And the kid had a big heart. I remember pulling up to my mother's house and seeing all the lights. And I remember the doctor coming out and telling my wife, your son didn't make it. We've been living in this bubble where we're trying to figure out who did this if somebody was ever going to be caught. You know, we've gone through four detectives, cold case detectives in four years or in three and a half years. There's no relief in this. It just rekindles bad memories, bad visions. I miss my son every day and that's hard because somebody took something from me and I can't get it back. You mentioned in 2018 that you would forgive whoever did this. What's your message to them? They stole from me. You stole my life. At that time, when we did the first interview, it was what I thought was the right thing to say. This hurt a lot of people and my son was, it was my son. And somebody stole his life. 